Hey guys, Ariel over here at Fine Net. I am going to make some little mini meatloaves today. This is a recipe that originally came from my cousin-in-law with a few Ariel modifications. So in this bowl I've got four pounds of this is actually ground elk because that's what I have you could certainly use ground beef that is what was in the original recipe or any other kind of ground meat so I pulled this out of the freezer last night to thaw and um, tossed it in the bowl a minute ago so I've got four pounds of meat you could obviously make a smaller portion if you want but I always seem to go through these pretty quickly around here um, the things I'm going to add here are, okay, I'm going to add quick oats. You could use rolled oats, but they would be a little more chewy in there. I'm going to do about two cups of oats in my generally very specific measuring style. That gives a little bulk and helps hold it together, especially because elk is such a lean meat. I'm going to do some eggs here. Pushed him. Should be a little more careful. Knocked his top off. I'm going to do six eggs with this because I like a lot of egg in there. With elk, it's so lean that it doesn't um, stick together like in a patty quite as well as beef does. So you could get by for sure with a little less egg if you were doing beef because beef has more fat in it naturally than elk does and so it'll hold its shape but since I'm doing elk the um, the egg kind of helps bind it together a bit. Those eggshells are going to go out in the compost pile. Get my fingers off there. Okay so I've got eggs, oats, mix them up just a tiny bit so that they can start to, the oats can start to soak up the moisture there. Now I'm going to do milk and again as you probably know I don't do much dairy. You could certainly use regular um, cow's milk or goat's milk or whatever. And I am going to use coconut milk. So I'm going to use a full can here, which would be so the 13.5 ounce can. Gotta be careful when you do that because the, the fat all rises to the top just like a regular milk and underneath is the more thin liquid. So that's going to be my milk so that can also start soaking into the oats. And give that a little bit of a mix. Now I definitely need some salt. With most recipes, just about anything you're doing with meat, half a teaspoon of salt to a pound of meat seems to be a pretty good proportion. So I've got four pounds of meat. I'm going to do two teaspoons of salt, approximately. And as you probably have heard me mention before, I like different real unrefined salts. That's Celtic Grey Sea Salt. It's a little moist and it looks kind of dirty and gray. So I'm going to mix that in there so that salt can start to dissolve. I could have used my salt grinder if I wanted the smaller granules, but that's um, there's enough moisture in here that's going to dissolve and mix in, so I'm not worried about it. Then I am going to... What am I missing? Oh, onions. Onions, besides tasting amazing, and therefore... They should go in lots of your food. Also are really good for you. Um, the, the same chemical, whose name I don't remember, that makes you cry when you cut onions, like I'm going to probably start doing here in just a minute, is actually one of the things that helps can kill germs and I get distracted when I'm trying to talk and work at the same time. Um, it's a, a good disinfectant. They'll soak up odors and bacteria. If you leave cut onions out, you know, if you leave cut up onions in your fridge or something, they kind of 
take on the flavor and somewhat flavor everything else in the fridge. And you can actually use them as a odor absorber if you want in a room, just cut it in half and let it sit there till it starts to go bad. It'll soak up a lot of bacteria and other crud out of the air, but they're also really good to eat. And I am going to start crying here in just a sec. These are a little stronger than some. I like, whew, I like all kinds of onions. Um, I think the yellow ones are probably my favorite for most cooking, but I sometimes do white ones and purple ones. And like with most things, there's slightly different um, nutrients in every different color. So I think doing some of all of them is going to give you a more well-balanced diet. Now how I usually dice up onions is in half. Um, it's nice if you're not crying so you can see what you're doing. Um, make some slices. I'm not worried about the, these chunks being super fine. I'm gonna spin them this way. If you hold things like this with that kind of claw grip, um, then you it's really hard to cut your finger because you're not gonna be able to cut against it. So I kind of just support the onion there and now I'm making little chunks. I'm gonna get part way down there, kind of roll it over and cut the rest of it there. So again, I've sliced it all this way and I'm going to just dice them up this way. So it gives me mostly even little cubes. You could be a little more particular with this, but there's no real reason to be. They cook soft and yummy in the meat. Oh, but they are getting to my eyes. Let's get them in there and mixed around. You don't want to, because of the bacteria absorbing properties of an onion, you don't really want to cut onions ahead very often. I mean, like, whew, <laughs> these are stronger than some. I'm really teared up. You don't want to cut them too far ahead. I mean, minutes is fine for sure, but like hours and hours because they are going to start to soak up whatever. Whew. I'm going to have to turn the camera off and go, uh, give my eyes a break. Um, whatever bacteria and stuff are in the air, so raw onions can be a little dangerous if left sitting out for a long time once cut up, um, as long as they're sealed up in their skins, that's not going to happen. But once they're all diced up like this, you wouldn't want to let them sit somewhere, especially somewhere dirty for very long if you were going to eat them again. If you're going to use them just to clean up crud out of the air, that's fine, but then you're not going to want to eat it. So two big onions. You could do a little more or a little less. Your taste. I'm going to rinse these now. So quit crying and can talk to you. But uh, in general, kind of like garlic, I think it's hard to have too much onion in most things because they're just, they're so nutritious for you and inf good at fighting germs and infections and everything. So I kind of mix that into my meat mixture here. So now I've got my eggs, my milk of some variety, my onions, salt, beef or elk or venison or whatever kind of ground meat you happen to like or have around. Okay, so now I can soak their crying little chemicals into my meat instead of my eyes. And I'm going to put some pepper in. I like fresh ground black pepper. So I've got one of these grinders. I'm just going to add a teaspoons. Again, of course, I'm not really measuring it, and you don't have to have fresh ground. I just think it's a little better flavor than um, the pre-ground stuff, because like most things, it'll start to lose flavor, and therefore, I think the flavor is kind of an indication of the nutrients, so uh, it's fresher is better. So I've got some pepper in there, and I'm going to add some parsley. I did not dry enough parsley this year because this jar is already getting low. But this is parsley from my herb bed out there. I'm going to say that's a generous tablespoon. And sprinkle that in. So the only seasonings I usually put in here are the, the parsley, the salt, and the pepper. 
Now, one other thing you can do, if you would like, is add some cheddar cheese. That was originally part of the recipe and is really tasty, but because most dairy doesn't sit very well with me, I choose to leave that out. But if you were going to, I'd toss in about four cups of cheddar cheese, mix that in here. That gives it a really good flavor too. If you have got no um, kinds of issues with eating dairy, I highly recommend tossing some in here because, especially if you can get a good quality cheddar cheese because it does taste really good. Though I really like the way it tastes just like this too. So now I'm going to put my meatloaves in my pans. I've got two nine by 13 pans here. They are, oh, they're different styles. You could put these into any kind of dish at all that um, had at least a little bit of an edge because they do have a little bit of juice that boils that. So I usually make, again, you could do any size you want, but I usually make kind of palm-sized little personal meatloaves that are about, you know, a good serving for a person. So I just kind of pat them together there. And I can usually get eight of these in a pan and this will usually make about two panfuls. You could easily do a smaller portion. When I put a recipe down in the see more tab down below, um, I will probably do proportions there per pound of meat. So that it's really easy to multiply or divide, you know, if you want to only do one pound of meat or, you know, do two or three or something instead of four, which is what I'm doing here. So just be aware of that in the see more tab, the proportions will be for, I guess I got that guy a little big. Let's reshape him. Um, the proportions will be for a single pound of meat, but to make the amount that I'm doing right here, I have used four pounds. There we go. And I like to do all of these because sometimes they come back over and kind of adjust their sizes to make them come out a little more evenly so that they'll bake nicely. This is a fun meal any time of the year. I have never served this to anyone who didn't love it. Um, but I think it's especially nice on chilly fall days, like today, when it actually got a little bit of a freezing, but then kind of rained and drizzled a little bit. I would prefer that it was just snowing at this time of year rather than rain to be honest but and there is still snow on the ground but today it was above freezing and drizzling instead so this is going to be a nice warm tasty meal i am plenty warm in my house i was outside earlier splitting a little more firewood and the wood stove's going in here so it is quite cozy You could also do this same mix as a regular um, large meatloaf in, in a loaf pan and slice it, but I kind of prefer, and I'm right, I did get my sizes a little off, steal some off of a couple of my extra big ones here to make this come out a little. That's part of the fun of cooking. You can do whatever you want. Just that there. And that way I can make two more here. So I got kind of even eight of them. Like most things, it doesn't require a lot of exactness, but if you get one really huge one and one really small one, the small one will tend to burn before the big one is done. And so that's why you want to keep them approximately even. Kind of like that. Okay. Okie doke. So I've got my 
16 meat loaves there, little personal meat loaves. And you could totally bake them just like that. They'd be great. But my favorite part is to make kind of a sauce for the top. And for that, these are also going to be going in my compost. For that, I use ketchup. Unfortunately, I don't have homemade ketchup since tomatoes don't grow in this area. It's too cold. But when you're buying ketchup, I recommend checking the ingredients. Um, a lot of ketchups have high fructose corn syrup in them, which is just um, really not good for your digestion. If you can get an organic one, this is just a store brand, relatively cheap organic one that uses actual sugar instead of high fructose corn syrup. So that would be a better option. Of course, I think the best would be making your own, and that's something I very much look forward to doing when I'm somewhere where I can grow my own tomatoes. So we've got ketchup. We're going to say that's a cup. Add some prepared mustard. We're going to call that maybe a quarter of a cup. I like mustard. So it's hard for me to get too much of that either. And then to kind of just caramelize the top a little bit, I do use some brown sugar. Again, if you're trying to avoid sugar, this would be just fine without. So I'm going to do about a cup of brown sugar in there. And this is going to be the topping for all of my meatloaf. that up. Make sure we get it kind of thoroughly mixed in. Any little lumps and chunks. And this is kind of going to be a, a barbecue sauce on top of the meatloaves. Now if you like it really spicy, I'm kind of a wimp about spicy things, so I don't tend to put a lot of spice in most of my dishes, but you could certainly add some red pepper, cayenne pepper, um, something like that. Even diced up fresh peppers in with the onions in the meat if you want a little extra heat with it, because I know a lot of people really do enjoy um, more spice than me. So, I'm going to use a spoon. Just going to put a little spoonful of this kind of right on top of each of my meatloaves. Don't worry about getting it down to the sides. It'll run down over the side plenty on its own. So just kind of a, a regular tablespoonful on top of each of those. Make it look all pretty and dressed up. And it also helps keep the top from drying out excessively in the oven. I have never, like I said, had anybody dislike this dish. So if you've got picky kids or picky adults, um, unless somebody doesn't eat meat at all, I think they're probably going to like this one. And I don't like to waste things if I can help it, so let me get one of my handy little rubber spatulas. These are, oh, I'm not a rep form or anything, but these are Pampered Chef rubber spatulas. They're the best ones I've ever found. I use them for everything I need a spatula for. So we'll just add a little extra here to a couple of these. Use up the tail end there. And there we go. Now these are ready to bake. I'm going to put them in a 350 degree oven for about 45 minutes. Um, the times can vary a little bit depending on your oven and exactly how big you make your little meatloaves. If they're smaller, obviously they'll bake a little quicker. If they're larger, it's going to take a little more time. So, in they go. Show you guys what they look like when they come out.
Mm. Okay guys, this is the finished product. Pans of little mini personal meatloaf. This is awesome. You can um, make the, this is a good meal to make ahead if you want to. You could make several pans and divide them out into portions of two or four or whatever and freeze them either raw or once they're baked, either way. If you want to, you know, be able to prepare a bigger batch if you've got freezer space and you like to have meals done ahead so that you could just pull something out and pop it in the oven, they work really great for that. Or even if you're just doing something like the day ahead, you know, if you're having a dinner party the next night, they'd be easy to mix up, have all ready to roll, stick in the fridge, and then bake the next day. So that's just some thoughts. Give it a try. Hopefully it's a recipe you guys like. Thanks for watching, folks. If you're interested in more info on my off-grid tiny house life, check out some of my other videos here. And if you like what you're seeing, click the little picture of my house to subscribe and then hit the little bell so YouTube actually notifies you every time there's a new video available. See y'all next time.